Welcome to Lambis.com and our lab video series in Cisco ICE 2.0. You can find a complete list of ICE video on our website by clicking on the link above and sign up for our newsletters to receive the latest video updates. Since this is our first videos in the video series, I would like to give you guys a warm welcome. For those of you who have been following our ICE video series, welcome back. Laminis have been covering Cisco Identity Services Engine since version 1.1, 1.2, and then 1.3. Although we kind of skipped version 1.4 since there wasn't much to cover in that version, and now it's time for the next version, which is 2.0. Since this is the major release, many of you may expect a lot of changes, and you are correct on that. One of the biggest changes in this release is probably the long-awaited TACX support. There are also other many cool features, which we will give you an overview in this video and cover them more extensively throughout our video series. If you're new to Cisco ICE, you might want to start by reviewing some of our previous ICE video series. As in this video series, we're just going to pretty much pick up where we left off from our ICE 1.3 video series. We were not going to be reviewing any basic configuration like how to configure map 82.1x guest access and things like that, but instead we are going to build the new 2.0 feature on top of the knowledge that you guys already know. With that said, let's get a first look at our ICE 2.0 web interface. For our lab setup, we have our Cisco ICE 2.0 with the name lm-ice1 sitting on VLAN 32 with the IP address of 172.16.32.102. On the same VLAN, we have our Windows 2012 Domain Controller and Certificate Authority Server at the IP of .40. And both the servers are connected to a core switch, Switch1, that's acting as default gateway and NTP server, and also provide access to the internet. And as a quick reminder here, our iServer, lm is one actually has to have some config on it that we kind of inherited from our lab video series, ICE 1.3. So things like policy set, online updates, protocol settings, and even the switch one has already been added to our server. So it's actually a full functioning server. And we will use that as a starting point for this video series. I think what we did on the update videos when the ICE 1.3 first came out worked pretty well, where we went through the web interface and point out what's new and what features are related to those section of the web interface and then kind of finish off the videos by reviewing the release notes just to make sure that we've covered all of the new features. So we're just going to stick to that format in this video as well. Since we didn't really have a video that's covered IS 1.4, we were trying to point out some of the features introduced in that version in this video also. All right, so let's get started with our lab here by first jumping into our RDP session that we already have the web interface open for our ICE 2.0. The first thing that you might notice here is the color theme that has changed to a darker blue color compared to what you guys might used to in the previous version. In terms of the menu options at first glance, it looks pretty much identical to the previous version except for the additional work center menu that you see in the right here that contains the feature specific configuration section, one for TrustSec and one for TACX device administration. We'll kind of talk about it a little bit more in a little bit here. On the right hand side, there's also some additional icons that you see. One is for license warning right now, just because we are running on the eval. Then there's a search icon that you can type very similar to what we used to have. Although the search bar is now hidden and it will show up when you click on that magnifier glass icon. Right next to it is for help to a Cisco ICE documentation. And one nice thing about this is, depending on what page you are currently on, when you click on it, the system actually takes you directly to the section of the document that's relevant to the page that you're on. So for example, right now we're on the ICE dashboard. That's why it took us to the ICE dashboard section of the document. All right, then you have an option here to run Setup Assistant. If you want to go through the wizard type of configuration process, then yeah, there's an option for the server information, click on it, and you see that currently you're locked in as a user, name admin, host name, persona, that's the node it's currently processing, system time, whether or not FIPS mode is enabled, the version, which is currently the 200306, and that's the FCS version without any patch apply right now. All the way to the right hand side with the gear icon, you got the account setting that you can change some of the settings of the currently logged in user. For example, currently we are logged in as the admin. You can enter email, first name, last name, just the basic account settings. 
online help probably takes you to the online documentations. If you click on that, there you go. And feedback, if you want to provide product feedback to Cisco. And finally is the about identity service engine, which provides you with the product identifier, version identifier, serial number. These are the basic information you would need in order to fulfill your ICE licenses. All right, so in terms of the dashboard page that we are on here, there's not a whole lot that has changed. You can see we still have the system summary, alarm authentication, and other sections, as well as the metric summary section on the top. So there's not much to talk about here. What we're going to do now is just going to progress from left to right and make our way through each of the menus and at the same time talk about some of the new features. Next is the operation menu. Here we have the live lock that has now been separated into radius and tacx live lock. Next menu is for reports and for the most part it's still the same except for the new section that's been added for device administration or TACX protocol. So you can see here authentication, authorization, accounting, and command accounting. All right next, you have the same troubleshoot section. So when I get into that, diagnostic tool, download lock, and then the last menu or submenu option under the operation here is adaptive network control. And that's what used to be an endpoint protection service or EPS. It's just has now been rebranded to adaptive network control or ANC. And under there, you have two separate menu options for policy list and endpoint assignment. And we'll have a dedicated video that we're just gonna talk about this adaptive network control feature. All right, let's move over to the next policy menu. Starting off with the policy set, since we already have policy set, enable with some of the policy sets configured even. What has changed here is some of the additional policies that's been added by default under the default policy set. As you can see here, it's actually disabled right now, but these are some of the policy that's been added for BYOD onboarding as well as the guest access. So I guess Cisco is trying to help you out with the default config so you don't have to configure it as much if you would like to enable those features. For us, we kind of have everything else created ourselves with the policy set on top, so we're not going to actually be using any of these default policies. All right for profiling and posture, it stays pretty much the same. There's nothing new here. You got profiling policies, logical profiles. Under the posture, you get the posture policy, same thing. Under the client provisioning, there are some additional default policies as we again keep disabled here for client provisioning or onboarding for iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac OS. Right? And these are the default client provisioning profile that was pre-created out of the box. All right, next let's get under the policy elements and look at under dictionaries. The new dictionaries has been adding here to support TACX obviously is the TACX dictionary. If you look on the system and you see there's a TACX here. Right now for conditions and authentication under compound conditions, it's not much change here, but under authorization, there's additional authorization conditions that was created to support the additional default policies that we just saw earlier. Like this one right here, BYOD is registered, guest flow, Mac and SAN, so on and so forth. All right, so you have an option to reuse those since they have been created for you. Let's get profiling since nothing changed there. Under the posture conditions, in addition to these default conditions, now to support the new features in 2.0, which is disencryption, you can see there's additional disencryption condition section, and that's just part of the posture enhancement in 2.0. All right, the next menu over is the results. And here under the authentication allow protocol, in addition to the default network access that we are used to see, now we have the default device admin and that will be used for the TACX authentication. If you're trying to create a new allow protocol right now, you see that on this page, there is a new option called EasyWired. And EasyWired is just the ability to authorize switch port without having a client running .1x, but instead by tapping into Windows user login activity and based on the pass or fail, the ICE can inform the switch whether or not to authorize the port. But this feature seems to have been removed from ICE 2.0 FCS. 
So on the Cisco doc, if you look up and search for EasyWire, it will be listed as for future use. So hopefully in the future release, we'll get to see that features becomes available. Scrolling down, you see the all the protocols again that you used to see. And the one that's new here is the support for eTTLS. And that's also something new in version 2.0. All right, moving on to authorization profile. As part of the new feature in 2.0 to support third party network access device. Now, if you're trying to create a new authorization profile, it has to be tied to either a specific vendor, just like how by default it's tied to Cisco here, or if you want to support multiple vendor, then you will select any to make this authorization profile generic. Okay, you can see as soon as you pick any, the options under the common task has certainly become less available. And we'll go through this features more thoroughly under the third party network access device videos. Another the options that are new here is the track movement. And this is part of the location-based authorization feature in 2.0. And location-based authorization allows you to create policy based on client location by having eyes working in conjunction with the Cisco Mobility Services Engine or MSE. And this track movement option allows the client location to be reevaluated periodically in case the client location changes and the different authorization profile needs to be applied. So for example, when the client moved from one building to another and the new building, the location that the client moved to, the client should no longer have access, then ICE will be able to reevaluate or reauthenticate that client accordingly. All right, there's nothing changed on downloadable ACLs. Let me cancel all of this, nor the profiling or the posture. So we're going to skip ahead and go under client provisioning resources. If you're trying to add a new native supplicant profile, what's new here as part of the client provisioning enhancement is the fact that you can now add multiple SSID into a single profile as opposed to when you used to only be able to add only one. Now you can have additional SSID if you like. I believe it could have been in that order of preference since you can see here that you can in fact reorder the SSID. Let's go ahead and try to click add and in addition to specifying the SSID name, you are now able to add proxy server information. So you see URL for the auto config file if you're familiar with how the web proxy work. And you've got the proxy IP and proxy port. All right, so let me cancel that and we still have the wiring profile section at the bottom. So let's go back to the resources. And this is more of the ICE 1.4 feature and that is the AnyConnect M enabler profile support. And, and that's when if you have a source file advanced malware protection for endpoint and want to have ICE initiate the software profile installation on the client, then you can create the AMP enabler profile right here and have that pushed as part of your AnyConnect client deployment. And that's all there is to it or that's our new under the policy menu. Next is the guest access. There's not a whole lot of change on the guest access side of feature since the guest access was actually revamped heavily back in ICE 1.3. So now in version 2.0, there's not a whole lot that's changed. There's a few minor enhancements. From the menu option here, what's changed is that the settings submenus are now expanded as opposed to showing just setting in the previous version. So you can actually go directly to each of those submenu from this dropdown. But otherwise, everything else is pretty much the same. There are a few guest enhancements, like I mentioned. Things like you can now update guest type on existing guest accounts, something that you can do earlier. We're not going to try to create one and show you here, but that's pretty much it for the guest access.